If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up the first John chapter five. And as you make your way there, I, I, every time we do a series, especially when it's an entire book from first verse to the last verse, we've done that since the beginning of July. So first John has 105 verses. And so today we come to the final um, eight or nine, eight verses. And so it kind of, to me, there's a sense of sadness that we're leaving. But tomorrow, next week we'll be in Second John, so we get his second version. And the next week after that we'll be in Third John. But there's also a sense of accomplishment because you've gone through the Word of God and, and it's verse by verse and, and you're digging into the truth. But I think when we are here now, five months later or four months later, sometimes we forget the original context. And we've mentioned it several times at the beginning, but let me refresh your mind as we close this epistle. The original audience is what we call second or third generation Christians. And that means that their parents or grandparents were the first to open up their heart to Christ and really break away from either Judaism or break away from their um, um, Gentile gods and, and, and all the other things they worship, or whatever that was out there. So they became believers. How many of you are first-generation believers in your family? First-generation believers means the first one in your family to accept Christ. Quite a few all over. Uh, for us who are more than second and third generations, the, the excitement is, for first generation, they endure perse- persecution, a hardship, being ostracized. A lot of times being left out or, or criticized. And so there's a zeal, there's a strength in our first generation believers. But when we, the first generation believers have children, they want to give their children something they themselves did not have. So it changes the home quite a bit. Now, the good news is these second and third generations, they receive rich Christian tradition. They receive a home, an atmosphere that's been cultivated. But that is the good part. The danger of second and third generation is sometimes we grow weary and we forget. That we, it's been given to us and everything's been kind of free and easy. And we kind of go through a, a, a shift to say, is that really for us? In Singapore, recent statistics say that from the ages of 18 to 35 here in Singapore, there is a fastest growing religion among the 18 to 35. Now, how many of you have children, I've said children, between 18 and 35, and I'm in that category, all of mine are in that category. So for those who are parents, and especially those who have grown up Christian and you've Drop uh, or you deposit that in your own children's heart, I think this will grieve your heart. The fastest growing religion in Singapore between 18 and 35, 45% of those, the fastest growing religion, ready for this? No religion. They just completely left away, whether it's Buddhists or Taoists or Christianity or Catholic, whatever it might be, they've just abandoned it. And so I think we look at this passage perhaps a little differently. That God wants not only the first generation and the parents, but the kids to know their own faith. And so we're going to go through what we call the marks of a true believer. Because God wants you to know this. Um, not too long ago, I met with six of our IBCers who are attending Cambridge. And they kind of conveyed to me this generation in their ages between 18 and 25 that they are struggling with their faith. They see so many of their fellow students who parents are Christians, but they're kind of in a, in a doubt zone, in a domain. And they're just struggling with that. And so God is writing these words to those who are struggling with doubts. And he wants you to know that you're a believer. So we've already mentioned a couple weeks ago, there are certain marks of a believer. In chapter 4, verse 13, is the first mark we gave. It says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his Holy Spirit. So the first mark of being a believer is the possession of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So if you're struggling whether or not you're a believer or not, one of the evidences and proofs and marks is that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Then verse 15 of chapter 4, we mentioned a couple weeks ago, says, whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So the second mark is a confession. So if you made the confession, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you fully accepted that and embraced that, and not only given a pledge of allegiance, but also a, a, a pledge of affection and, and devotion as well, then God says that's a mark. And then verses 16 through 21, really it's that whole theme that we've been talking about, that another evidence and proof that you're a believer is that you love those around you. 
So God says in chapter 4, verse 20, it says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who, who does not love the brother whom he has seen cannot lie, love the brothers that he, the God that he hasn't seen. And so God tells us that the evidence is there. Now we come to chapter 5 and we're going to deposit inside of you today four other marks. So I want you to do an examination of yourself. But I want you to know God's purpose in this is very clear. He wants you to know. He wants you to have no confusion at all. He wants you to be confident. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to be courageous. He wants you to, to, to walk with a step that is, is absolutely in knowledge and in, in absolute awareness and acceptance of who you are in Jesus Christ. So the first mark is found in chapter 5, verse 13. And he says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So another mark, according to verse 13, is that if you are a believer, a mark of the believer is actually that you have the assurance that you're a believer, that you're confident. So let me break it up in two ways with this um, true believer has and possesses a, a confidence and an assurance of, of that salvation of knowing God. So he says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. So there is a, what I call a certainty of knowing. So that word says, this is a confidence. So this is confidence that we have before him. And so that, that word that, that you may know, he does not want you to doubt. He doesn't want you to be confused. He doesn't want you to, to constantly scratch your head, to, to constantly question. He wants you to have absolute confidence and certainty that you are a child of God. And so all of these things that he's written in the first five chapters are there. So what has he written? Look what he says in verse one of chapter one. What was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands, this, this, this word of life. And so God says, you hear, then based on that hearing, you believe, and then based on that believing, according to 1 John, you live this out, and as you live your faith out, God says he gives you the absolute certainty and knowledge that you belong to God. So that's the certainty of knowing. But in contrast to the certainty of knowing, there is what I call the uncertainty of doubting. And if you've ever doubted your, your walk with God at times, and there's been many times when you question whether it's God's, um, is, he, is that promise for real? Do you feel like a Christian today? Or there may be um, tests that you felt like you failed or you're inconsistent. But let me tell you what doubts do. Doubts really rob your joy. It's the foxes in the vineyard. Uh, for those who doubt, your joy is gone because you're constantly questioning, you're constantly interrogating, you're constantly wondering, and, there's, and it steals your joy. It stunts your growth as well. You, you're not growing. It, it, it cripples your service. If you're doubting, there's no way you can grow. If you're constantly doubting your relationship with your husband and wife, let me tell you this, your marriage is not growing. If you're constantly doubting, if you're in the wrong job, you're not growing in that job. If you're constantly doubting you're in the wrong church, let me tell you, you're not growing in this church. If you're doubting, it, cur it cripples your service, it robs your joy. But I want you to know that God today wants you to know. Many of you recognize the name Henry Ward Beecher. He was a 19th century orator. And when he was in secondary school, he was asked to do a math equation. So the teacher gave him the, the math equation. How many of you remember kind of gives our age away. How many of you remember what a blackboard is? And it's not on a computer screen, by the way, not that blackboard. So there was a blackboard, so he was doing it with chalk. Anybody know what chalk is? Okay, so he was doing an equation on chalk, and so as he was doing the equation, about halfway through the equation, he was feeling pretty confident, and halfway through the equation, the teacher shouted at this, no, no. Well, it shook his confidence. He, 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 he did a little bit more, and, and she went, no. And so he just kind of crumbled into his seat, sat down. She asked another student to come up, and he began proceeding doing the same equation exactly the same way he did. And the teacher went, no, no. And the student just kept right on working the equation until it was completely done. And then he sat down, and the teacher said, good job. Henry Ward Beecher was a bit confused, right? You're messing with a secondary school. Who's, the mind still needs to be developed. But he was, he was going, why, teacher, did you say no to me? 
And she said, why did you not say yes to me? You could have kept working that problem. And then she said, you, it is not good enough for you just to know the, the equation and the problem and solving it. You must know that you know. God says he wants you not just to know that you're a child of God. He wants you to know that you know that you're a child of God. So that's the first evidence, the, that assurance that we are children of God. So what's the second proof? We come to chapter um, 5 and verse 14. It says, this is a confidence that we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he what? What does your scripture say? The very last phrase of verse 14. He what? Here is us. Isn't that amazing? So we have this confidence in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15. Not only that he hears us in whatever we ask, but we also receive the requests that we've asked from him. So the second mark of whether or not you're a child of God and that you have this mark in front of you is that you experience confidence in answered prayer. So we've already talked, you possess the Holy Spirit, you confess Christ, you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you have the assurance, confidence that you know that you know that you're a child of God. The next one is now God says you have the confidence in answered prayer. So what does the word confidence mean? The confidence means boldness, access, that there's no wall there. It means openness to come to him at any time. I have the boldness and the confidence to come to God at any time. How many of you, I've been um, in a battle with Singtel recently, and so how many of you have ever called Singtel and you don't hear a human voice for 20 minutes? You know, they're always putting you next, 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 right? Or, or uh, would you mind waiting? And I said, how long? And I think they said the word eternity. I'm not sure. <laughs> but how many of you, hear, it's like, ah. But whenever you call on God, the line is never busy. You're never put on hold. And you never get an automated voice. Confidence. Access. Anytime. So what is the basis of this confidence? Now there's a, I have so many people say, Pastor, I have confidence and I have faith that I'm going to win the lottery. Wow, that's revolutionary, right? And revelatory. Uh, or I have confidence I'm going to get that promotion. I, I know God will give that to me. Now is it an amazing that we have confidence, but there must be a basis of that confidence. So it says, this is the confidence, this is the openness that we have, the sureness, the, the, the boldness to come into God, that anything that we ask, and the basis of our confidence is what? According to the will of God. Now in chapter 3, verse 21, it says, if our heart, if, if our heart does not condemn us, it says we have confidence, same word, before him. And then chapter 3, verse 22 says, whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments, and we do what is right or what is pleasing in his sight. So earlier, John says you can have confidence the same way if you're walking in obedience. So when you pray, if you're obedient to God, God says you have this confidence and boldness. Second basis of our confidence is you pray according to the will of God. That's key, right? That you can, you can come with openness and confidence that this is the will of God. And I know this without a doubt. So when you say, Pastor, I can come with boldness and confidence that I'm going to win the lottery. I'm going to ask you, is that the will of God? And some of you say, certainly. But I'm going, where in Scripture is that? But a lot of times, this is what we do. We ask for God to give us something, and we claim it to be his will. God, this is where my child needs to go to university. It is God's will. This is the job that I want. This is God's will. It's God's will that every job that I ever want, it's always, why is God's will always a pay raise? Have you ever noticed that? Always God's will, no matter what. No matter what's going on, if it's a pay raise and it's a promotion, it's God's will. How do you know that? In scripture, you you might find a different strategy and different paradigm. Nor does it mean that when we pray according to the will of God, do we impose our will on God's will. That means we force God. We always say, God, this is what I want in Jesus' name. But it has nothing to do with God's will. So we try to impose our will. Or we try to bend our, uh, God's will to our will. We try to shape it. How many of you remember Moses? Remember when he killed the Egyptian? All right. But he knew he was a deliverer. That was God's will. But guess what he did? He did God's will his way. 
So many of you may be doing God's will, but then once you get that job or get into that school or you get into this church and God's will for you to be the IBC, but then you start serving here or working here, but you do it your way. That's imposing and bending his will. Or you're asking God to change his will. I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, over the last 15 years, say, Pastor, I want you to meet, this is God's will for me. This is my fiance and we're gonna get married and it's God's will. I say, how do you know? And they kind of explain this, you know, they're, they're, they're like, they're, 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 their throat is dry, their hands are all palmy sweaty, and they said, oh, she makes me feel like this, it's God's will. And I said, but is she a believer? And they said, no. I said, how can you say it's God's will when God's word says, do not be unequally yoked? See, we, we make and we impose, we change, we bend. But according to God's will means that we yield to him that we submit, that we give way. It's Jesus in the garden when Jesus says, let this cup pass for me, but then he makes this prayer. Not my will be done, but what? Anybody remember the rest of it? Your, your will. So when we pray according to God's will, we line our heart, our mind, underneath the will of God. So that's the, the basis, that's the confidence that we have. Why? Because we're praying. How do we know the will of God? The word of God. Study the word of God, the heart of God, the direction of God, all of that. But now we come to the third part of this prayer is that God's response. So he does two things in response. First of all, in verse 14, he says, this is a confidence that we have before him, that we can ask anything according to his will. And what's his first response? He what? He hears us. Now we hear the word hear, and obviously he takes it in, right? But it's a favorable hearing. He's like leaning. I love Isaiah 65, verse 24. It says, before we call, you will answer. And why are we yet speaking? He will hear. So he's kind of in a posture of readiness to respond to our requests. Now, I don't know about you. How many of you are parents of teenagers? Okay. How many of you ever get requests from teenagers? Isn't it remarkable that every request has something to do with money? And, and I, I can remember that, or uh, we were teaching our boys how to drive, um, and, and every, like, every day they would say, Dad, take me tri- driving, Dad, take me driving, Dad, take me driving, and it just drove me insane. So it's like, before, as they started talking, Dad, can you take me, my internal voice was going this, no, but I heard their response, but I was not responding favorably. But God says whenever he hears, he's ready to answer. He's already leaning. He's already moving. He's already getting things involved. And not only is he favorable, that hearing implies an intimacy and a closeness as well. Then we come to the second response. It's found in verse 15. So the first response, he hears us. And then verse 15 says, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we've asked from him. So not only does he hear He responds, and he answers our prayer. Now, I'm going to just, it's going to be not completely in line here because you're praying according to the will of God, but usually when people pray, God has four responses. So this might encourage you and instruct you on what is God's response when you pray. First one is an easy one, right? Yes. (laughs) You pray, God answers. Sometimes it's immediate. Sometimes it opens up before your very eyes. When Peter was in prison, the church of Jerusalem was praying for Peter, and that night, immediately the doors opened. Would you say that's pretty immediate, right? And how many of you have had immediate requests? Like, Lord, I need a job, and that day you got a job. You know, I mean, not always, but it happens. Or you need an answer, wisdom, and making a decision, and God just points you to the right scripture, or he sends a friend, or he gives counsel, or whatever it might be, and God gives you exactly what you need. Yes, perfect timing. There was a missionary by the name of um, Ruth Nolan, and she was praying, and it was late at night, and she was praying, and God strongly put on fellow missionaries who were in Argentina, about 900 miles, um, out, uh, 900 kilometers outside of Buenos Aires, and their names were Ed and Linda Abels, and she couldn't get them off their mind, her mind. So she prayed, and she marked the time. It was 10.30 at night. So she got on her knees, she was praying. It was um, a very intense prayer. Then after the time of prayer, she got up and began to try to call them, and no answer, no response. 
She knew some other missionaries in the area, so she called their friend and come to find out that this couple were actually at the hospital being tended to for wounds that they suffered during an armed robbery in their private home, in their residence. And so finally, she got a hold of Ed. And, 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 and Ruth was telling him, says, I was praying for you right at 10.30. She said, he said, you're not going to believe it. But right at 10.30, because he obviously marked the time, the robber had come into the house, had held a gun to his head, and at 10.30, pulled the trigger. But it did not go off. The police later told Ed that as he was pulling the trigger, he just thought, okay, it wasn't loaded. It just wasn't loaded. The police officers on that particular gun, you could actually successfully pull the trigger if the bullet was not in the chamber. The gun had misfired. But Ruth's prayer did not misfire. It aimed and it hit the target. So God says, whenever you ask, the first response that God gives, can give, is yes. The second one, though, is a little bit more challenging. How many of you have ever prayed a prayer and God said this? No. Would you say he hasn't answered your prayer? No, he answered your prayer. What was the answer? No. No. I mean, it's very clear. You pray and God says no. In Acts chapter 16, Paul wanted to go to Asia. And God and the Spirit of God intervened. It says it specifically in Scripture. And God said no. So move somewhere else. So here, God says, this is what you need to do. No. The third option, this is where it gets kind of a little bit more challenging for us. Remember Martha and Mary, they asked Jesus to come because Lazarus was sick, right? They said, come, 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 come. And he delayed two extra days, remember? And then he traveled two days. And Lazarus was actually dead. So that was what we would call a divine delay. So you ask for something and God says this, not now. Can't tell you how many times I prayed for my prodigals. And I wanted it now. I was in tears on my face before God. And I'm asking God, bring my prodigal home. Divine delay. There was work he was doing. There was something moving beyond my scope, my understanding, my realm of of knowledge. Divine delay. Why did Lazarus die? In order to bring glory to God. So sometimes there is divine delay. The fourth one's the most confusing, you know. It's when he gives you a, a totally different answer than what you asked. Paul, the thorn in the flesh, remember that? And he's asking God. Two times he prayed, obviously no answer, no response, so kind of like a silence there. The third time God answered, he said, Lord, remove this thorn from my flesh. And God says, my grace is what? Sufficient for you, and my power is perfected in your weakness. Paul is going, but the thorn, (laughs) the thorn. Some of you are going, but my job, my job. I need to get out of here. Uh, My family. And we're praying about everything. I talked to a group of single ladies last night. And I said, how many of you are praying for the husband? And all eight of them raised their hand. And I said, how many times does God say, and they went, divine delay, divine delay. We understand. But then I said, how many times does God give you a different answer than you asked for? You're asking for a husband, and God says, I'm going to give you a ministry. No way men said that all. (laughs) But I was asking for a husband, but God has something else in store for you. So sometimes we have a request, and God doesn't actually give us. My mentor told me when I was 20 or 21, as I was underneath him, and he says, "Um, if you ask the wrong question, you might get the wrong answer. So sometimes we're asking, why, God, has this happened to me? That may not be the right question. The question is, how can God receive glory out of this? We forget that sometimes that prayer answers a little bit differently. Now we come into the most difficult part of the, probably the whole text here. And it's part of the confidence that we have in answered prayer. And he's actually, the Apostle John is going to give an illustration. So we're going to read verses 16 and 17 together. It's kind of tough, all right? So he says, if anyone sees, that means you have to notice something. If you see a brother committing a sin, ready for this? Not leading to death. All right, got that? If anyone sees a brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask God, or he shall ask, and God will, for him, give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not ask, I do not say that you should make a request for this. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. How many of you say, Pastor, thank you so much. You read that. It is absolutely clear. Not even one. Not even one. I was thinking we could just bypass this and just move to the next. This is a very difficult text, so we're going to break it up in two categories. The first one is, it's an illustration, but he targets the first, that you pray for the ones who are committing sin, not leading to death. But it starts with if you see, if you observe. So you're walking along in your, in your faith, and you see a, a brother, says a brother, by the way, child of God, this is part of the family. You see a brother committing a sin, but what kind of sin? A sin not leading to death. So first of all, you observe. This is not gossip, by the way. It's not something you heard from someone else. It's not something that, that's on the, uh, uh, like, oh, but, but you know, this, this brother told me about this. And, no, no, you personally have to observe it. But when you observe it, what is your response? It says, if you observe this, if you see this, your first response is not to condemn. A lot of times we see a brother committing a sin or a sister committing a sin. The first action is condemn. Or, especially here in Asia, what do we do? We save face. We don't say anything. We ignore it or overlook it. But our first response as a child of God is to pray. Remember earlier in 1 John, this is in the spiritual resources, but in 1 John 3, it talks about the physical resources. In verse 17, it says, whoever has the world's goods in his possessions, so that says you have resources, and you see, same word, if you see a brother in need, and you close your heart against him, how does the love of God abide in you? So very clear, right? Brother in need, you see, you have physical resources, and you are to meet that need. Here, a little different category. Here you see somebody in need, but it's a spiritual need. And we as believers actually have a spiritual resource called prayer. We can tap God and we can pray. Two years ago, we went through the epistle of James. The very last two verses of James says this. If any among you stray from the truth and one turns him back. So somebody strays, wanders away from the truth. Similar to this. And one turns him back. Let him know that the one who turned him back, one that turns a sinner from the error of his way, will save his soul from death. So God says we have a responsibility that when we see a brother or sister committing sin, we are not to condemn and we're not to overlook. We are to pray. That is our response. We are to ask. And what do God says? God says in verse 17, if we ask, or in verse 16, if we ask, God will give for him life. That's the opposite of death. So if you're committing a sin that, that ultimately says obviously not leading to death, but God will give life and restoration and renewal and, and unbelievable. So what's the question? And this is the easier of the two. The, the first question is, what is a sin not leading to death? Well, it's every sin that can be forgiven, that can be asked for, that can be repented of, that can be um, um, put before the blood of Jesus Christ. All through John, he's not telling any of us that we are sinless. In fact, in 1 John 2, it says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you in order that you may not sin. Now, that's the goal. But in the same verse, he says, but if anyone does sin, <laughs> that's us, let him know that he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In fact, if you have the boldness and audacity to say, Pastor, I don't sin, why don't you go back to chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, if we say that we have no sin, it says we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. In chapter 1 verse 10 it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar, him a liar, and his word is not in us. So God never says that we don't sin. But there is a sin that leads to death and there's a sin that doesn't lead to death. As believers, correcting a brother, because guess what? We're not going to spiritual death. That sin that we commit will not separate us from God eternally because we're already a child of God but there's a sin that we commit that still needs to pray be prayed for so God says pray for that person that in order to be restored so we have brothers and sisters in Christ that you know are in trouble we do not need to condemn them and we don't need to ignore them we need to find God and ask God's infinite resources to pour into that person now we come to the most difficult part all right Right there after that, after we pray for them and God will give life to them, to the ones committing a sin not leading to death, then he makes this bold statement. There is a sin leading to death. And then he makes even more difficult or statement that says, I do not say that you should make a request for this. Very confusing, right? So here we go. 
I believe there are um, basically, and, and the, the, the outline says, he does not give us a command to pray for those who commit a sin leading to death. Now, I want you to understand that whenever he talks specifically about the person committing sin not leading to death, he says, if you see your brother, and I think there's going to be a big distinction within the text itself, he never identifies the person committing a sin leading to death as a brother. Very important distinction. I think it's an entirely different category. The category, the first category is all of us who are believers and we commit sin, we do. But God says we should pray for one another in order that we can be restored, that life can be um, given back again. But there are sins that are being committed or sin that's being committed that actually leads to death and it never specifies that that person is a brother or sister. So there are four basic interpretations, and I rarely do this, but I think it's a difficult passage, and we've got to do justice, and we've got to respect the text. And so let me give you four, but I'll walk you through them and kind of um, interchange. So this is a little different sermon this morning. So the first possibility that people say, what is that sin leading to death? Some people say it's a physical death. It's like Ananias and Sapphira. It's like they, they, they lied to the Holy Spirit, and God struck them down, even though they were part of the church. Or it's like 1 Corinthians 11 when you take the supper in an unworthy way. And it says, as a result of this, some of you are sick and some of you sleep, which is a biblical way of saying, you're gone, you're dead. So, is, and some people attach the physical death to this. But I would say, in this context, it would be very challenging to do that. Because in verse 13, it says, in order that you may know that you have eternal life. So we're not talking about eternal life versus physical death. We're talking about eternal life versus eternal death. We're talking about spiritual life versus spiritual death. So the the context really doesn't point to a sin that you commit, that you will physically die here. Again, no brother here, no sister in Christ, no no identification. The second interpretation is, is a specific sin. Like there's one sin that will get you done. Like if you're mean to Pastor Rodney, that's done, it's gone. It doesn't say that, but it's like, what sin is it? So you begin to calculate in your mind. And so in the Old Testament, it kind of opens the door a little bit. If you've studied the Old Testament, you know that sometimes the writers make a a distinction between unintentional sin and intentional sin. And it seems like forgiveness is very readily available if you accidentally do something wrong. But it doesn't really deal with, especially in the Torah, sins that are intentional. seems like there could be no forgiveness for that at times, but then you see later on in their history where people are forgiven all the time. So I'm not sure, but the Roman Catholics, many of you grew up as a Roman Catholic, and you may be familiar, but they actually have two categories of sin. Anybody remember what they are? Mortal, which means you commit that sin, you're gone. There is no hope for you. Venial, which means sins that are committed that are forgivable, okay? But I think you have to look at verse 17 to answer that question very quick. Is it a specific sin? that commits you to death. Look what it says in verse 17. All unrighteousness is what? No distinction. No venial sin, no mortal sin. Every sin will get you death, okay? Now we come to the third and fourth, and these, to me, are the ones that are the struggling. It's third, um, the possible view is what we call apostasy. It means that you commit a sin as a believer and you fall away from the faith. Hebrews chapter 6 says, you've tasted the heavenly gift. You've been partakers of his divine nature. You you go through all of these things and it says, and you apostatize, you turn away, and you wander away, and it says, it is impossible to renew you to repentance again. Or you put God to an open shame. It's, it's, It's one of those elements that you teach apostasy. The problem is, that's the writer of Hebrews. This is the writer of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, if you remember from a couple weeks ago, it says this. It says, they went out from us because they were not really of us. If they, would have, if they would have been of us, they would have remained with us. So the very fact that they left proved that they were not ever in. And I think you have to look at 1 John's context as immediate understanding. So I don't think it's apostasy. And we also see in 1 John 3, 9, difficult, the other, other difficult passage says, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So God says there's no habitual sin, that, that if you're a habitual sinner, you never were a believer to start with. So God's very clear on that. So the fourth and the final, and I'll leave it with this. I believe it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's rejection of the Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. 
It's those who have never been converted. Remember, there's no designation of brother here. In verse 16, it says, if you see a brother committing the sin not leading to death, but then he says there is a sin leading to death. So I think there is a distinction there, but it also co- coincides with everything else, that if you are never, and you're persistently in sin, you're persistently rejecting, it's not, God offers it to you, but you say no. You say no, 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 no. And ultimately, it says that you actually seal your own fate. Now, Jesus, and John does not, and this is where it gets interesting, John does not forbid intercession because he says, I, I do not, I, he says, I, I do not ask you to, to make a request for this. That's kind of a weird way of saying stuff, right? He's not telling you, don't pray for them. He just says, I'm just going to ask you not to make a request for this. So we had, after the service last night, we had a small group right over here. There were 10 ladies. They said, Pastor, we gotta ask you, do you not pray for your, the prodigal who's away from God? Do you not pray for your hardened mom and your hardened dad? I mean, ha, 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 you quit praying? Like, what is that? Well, I think um, Calvin probably said it very well. He says, we should not pray where God's will stands against us. So if God said this is the will of God and you pray against the will of God, Romans chapter one, anybody remember that passage? And it says they exchanged the worship of a creature from worshiping the creator. They exchanged their bodily lustings and cravings for opposite sex for those of the same sex. And it says very clearly God gave them over. And if God gives them over and you're gonna pray that God won't give them over, are you gonna go against that? And so what happens, and I don't think it's like at the beginning, I think it's going a, a long life of persistent rebellion, cold-hearted rejection of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I'm going to ask very simply, very strange word, and I do not say that you should make a request for this. So there's been many, many times I've prayed for people, but there have been people i prayed for 25 years later, they opened their heart up to Christ, or on their deathbed at the age of 80, when we've been praying for them for a long time. So I don't know how to clearly answer this to you, but just know that there are times when God says, the will of God is this. And he says, I'm just going to ask you not to pray and request this. So this is the second assurance that you have confidence in answered prayer, and then he gives an illustration. The third one's a little bit easier because we've been walking through this. The third um, proof or mark is that you do not commit habitual sin. And we've talked about that in chapter three, but we'll quickly review. So right after all of that confusion, right? Commit sin not leading to death, commit sin leading to death, whatever that means. And it's challenging, it's hard. But then he comes with three straight we know. In verse 18, he says, we know that no one who is, no one sins who is born of God. Verse 19, we know that we are of God. Verse 20, we know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has come. So he's backing it up with confidence. And what's the confidence? That you cannot commit habitual sin and be a child of God. You cannot persistently go after sin and say that you're a child of God. It says no one who is born of God sins. What? Then he says, but he who was born of God keeps you, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the the one that was the only begotten. He keeps, he guards, and then it says the evil one will not touch you. So if you're a child of God, God says the evil one cannot touch you. It goes back to John chapter 10 that says, I will give eternal life to you and you will never perish, and I will hold you in my hand, right? And my Father, who's greater than all, is greater than me. And he will also, and no one will be able to snatch you out of his father's hands. So the evil one cannot touch you. So we have that confidence that we do not practice habitual sin. Then it says in verse 19, we know that we are of God. So our nature is a little different, our DNA. And the evil one, and that the whole world is underneath the power of the evil one. So if you're a child of God, you're protected. And by the way, if you're not, you're exposed to the power of the evil one. And then verse 20 says, we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and that we are in him who is true, in the Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true, true God and eternal life. So he closes with this unbelievable, says, if you know that Jesus Christ has come and what was his purpose is to take away sin. And if you have the one who's taken away sin, why are you still sinning? 
Why are you still habitually sinning? And it would be proof that you do not belong to God because the God who lives inside of you is removing sin, is forgiving sin, is, 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 is healing your heart, but yet you keep sinning. And it's proof that you do not belong to God. But God says, proof is, is that you belong to Jesus Christ and it keeps you from habitually, persistently, defiantly sinning. Then we come to the last one. This is what I call the postscript. So it's kind of like the last words of the letter is eternal life in verse 20. And then he writes almost a PS. Like, okay, I got one extra word. Before, before I sign off, I want you, my little children, this is the seventh time he says it. He says, my little children, guard yourselves from idols. Kind of like one last punch. And what does this mean? If you're a child of God, you express allegiance only to one. Only to Jesus Christ. And so he says, guard. What does the word guard? Put distance, protect, put a wall up. Do not even encroach. Don't play with that. Guard yourself from idols. And many of us, we live in Singapore. So we see idols everywhere, do we not? The physical idols. And obviously that was a reference in Ephesus where John was writing. It's in Ephesus in the first commandment with the Old Testament. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself any graven images. So we got that. But I believe that idols are still in existence today. And they're a little different, maybe. An idol is anything that competes or replaces God. Now, how many of you know what this is right here? Yeah, anybody know what this is? It's a phone. How many of you say this is the first thing you look at in the morning? And it's the last thing you look at at night. And right in the middle of the sermon, somebody sent you a message that obviously is very important. Because what they're saying is, I see you committing sin looking at your phone, and I'm praying for you. (laughs) But so many times... We put things above God, that we replace or allow things to compete. And it may be a phone, it may be a job, that it really grabs your heart and your passion and your priority. It's your income, it's your possessions, it's your relationships, it's, it's your aspirations, it's your hobbies. There's a lot of things I love, a lot of things. I love to eat. No amens on that, am I the only one? I mean, there's certain things I love to eat. There's things I, I love to play. I love to play basketball. I love to play golf. I love, I, I, there's I, sports I love. I love, I love my family. But, but they can become idols. Even a grandson. Can you believe that? That if it takes priority over God, if it competes with God, if it replaces God. One writer says that the human heart is like a factory of idols. Calvin said this, the human heart, human nature is a perpetual factory of idols. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3, kind of sets it up even better. It describes it more accurately. It says, we have set up idols in our heart. If we give our life and our love to someone else, we have an idol. And if somebody, this is the key, if somebody takes our heart from God, that is your idol as well. So the world has three responses to idols. Very clear. Love them, trust them, and obey them. That's what the world wants from the idols. Trust them, you love them, and you obey them. God has three words for idols. Tear them down. Take it down. Put the phone in the other room while you have your quiet time. Turn your phone on silent when you come into the Lord's house. Focus on what the things of God. Your first priority is not to hear somebody's text or message or social media, but maybe your spiritual media, like you and God. God is asking for you to put priority And as you do this, God will give you the assurance. How? Because your allegiance is to him exclusively and only. So we've laid this out of knowing, knowing, knowing that you may know, that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. And we've given you these characteristics and marks. But it'd be kind of tragic if you didn't know, right? So when we walk out of here today, you're going to fall in one of two categories. You know or you don't know. (laughs) And we're going to put it in straight categories and spiritually. Either you know you're a Christian or you know that you're not a Christian. Very straight categories. Or you don't know you're a Christian or you don't know if you're not. So there's like two main categories and two subcategories. Everyone's followed so far. In 1994, there was an old airline by Northwest Airlines. Anybody remember that old name? Northwest Airlines. So it was in the U.S. And they gave a special deal. It was called Mystery Fair. So for 59 U.S. dollars, you would show up at the airport and they would give you your ticket to your surprise destination. Would that not be fun in Singapore? Like you just show up at the airport with $59 and you go, where am I going? And they say, North Korea. (laughs) 
Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, you could be surprised, right? Some of you are freaking, I can see it already, you're already sweating because you're planning your trips like years in advance. But this is a mystery, so a lot of people responded. In one particular smaller city in the U.S. by the name of Minneapolis, in 1,500 people were in the queue for surprise mystery destinations, mystery destinations, mystery tickets. And so one guy got up and he was really longing to go to New Orleans. And that's where the food and the jazz and all of that stuff. So he was, and he, got that, he looked at his, his destination ticket and he got, don't take this offensively if you're from this city, but he got stuck with Minneapolis, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere. So he was so upset. He paid all of $59 for the surprise destination. He got stuck with this ticket. So he went to the airport and says, free ticket, I'll, I'll trade you. I'll trade you anything and anywhere. If you want a ticket to the famous Mall of America. By the way, that's the mall that was the one of the largest malls. So he, he gives, he says, I'll go anywhere. Now, what would be tragic is when we come to our death and we are standing at the counter and we're not real sure where we're going. If you're here today and you don't know, God says you can know. And if you're a child of God, he wants you to walk out of here. Because I think you act different when you know, don't you? I think, like, for instance, we have some of our, our ladies here who are pregnant. Is it, like, if you, if you knew you were pregnant or if you didn't know you were pregnant, would you be acting different, right? Like, if I say, if you're pregnant, you say, I don't know, you know? But if you would say, are you pregnant? And you said, yes, would you act different? As a mom, absolutely. How about this one? How many of you would act different if you knew you were married? <laughs> like if you go to work on a new job or you're meeting somebody at school or whatever, and they said, are you married? And you said, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you would act different if you didn't know, right? Or how about if you say, I know. Would that be a different response? Absolutely, right? If someone says, are you a member of IBC? And you say, I don't know. Well, if you know, you act a certain way. So God is saying, today, you can know. All these evidence. Yeah, we went through a, a, a very tough passage in here. Trust me, I, I struggled with it. I, talking it as much as you struggle hearing it. But when it comes down to it, God wants you to know that you know. So when you walk out of here today, I want you to know that you know that you're a child of God. And if you do, let me tell you, your life is different. You pray with confidence. You walk in truth. You're bold about your faith. No question mark. No doubt. How many of you, if you're a student, and they, they, or, or, or you're at a school, and they said, are you a student here? And you said, I don't know. I mean, that would, or, you, or you show up at an office, and they say, do you work here? And they ask, and you say, I don't know. That would, I mean, it changes everything. But when you say, I know, so I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. And many of you know who our pastors are, but I'm going to have them stand up real quick. Pastor Keith and past, Pastor, um, our minister Peter, stand if you would please, because I want you to see. And our pastors over here, Pastor Andy and Pastor Lloyd. So we have pastors that are available to chat with you. Yesterday after the sermon, it was so confusing to 10 of our young adults that they said, Pastor, can we talk to you? And so we had a small group right after the church for about 20 minutes asking all these questions about what does this text mean. We want to encourage you today. If you're here today and you just want someone to pray with you, if you're in that doubting domain, we want you to know, because doubt steals joy. Doubt cripples your service. Doubt stunts your growth. But when you know that you know, there's a difference. See, I know that I'm a child of God, and I'm going to act a certain way. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've entrusted. I know this. And God says he wants you to know that you know. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are asking you, I know today was a tough message in many ways, but Father, the bottom line is, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Father, if there are idols that are keeping our hearts from you, put them down tear them down. Father, we need help. Father, give us that confidence in our prayer that we trust you as we pray according to your will. Father, we want that uh, just habitual holiness, not habitual sin, but habitual holiness. Give us a heart and a longing to walk with you. Father, I pray today as we walk out of here, I pray that we walk with your power and your confidence and your boldness and your courage 
that we are different people because we are children of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go with God's grace, go with God's peace, and if you're here, like for us to pray with you, we'd be honored to do so. God bless.